I'm glad to be here after the coffee break. I know many of you have flown here from international locations. Our colleague from Brazil mentioned his afternoon there. I know it's nighttime or early morning for some of you as well in your home country. So I appreciate you being here. And uh, hopefully you got some caffeine in your system. Wow, we've already lost three minutes on the clock. I only started talking. Um, OK, so um, I'm going to talk about Sprint's plans for 5G, what we're rolling out, what we've announced publicly, and, and how that uh, dovetails with our, our overall strategy. And then the, the titles actually has, has two meanings. It's really Sprint strategy, our, our 5G world, and then it's our collective 5G world. What are we building? What, are, what is it going to look like? And what are we enabling when, when we do this? So I'll start with something that everyone's very familiar with, um, because it always gives people comfort, although that curve shouldn't give anybody comfort, because it obviously demonstrates the, the, the stress that's on the industry and why we really need 5G going forward. Um, the, the key message here is that the exponential growth is not going to go away, but it will be augmented by new use cases. It's very clear that uh, video dominates most networks in the world right now, and that won't stop, but it will slow down as, as adoption approaches 100%. Um, there will be some growth additionally. I think video will be consumed more and more by AI in addition to humans, and of course that will drive traffic growth. But there's a, a plethora of new industry use cases which are coming on board, which will be driving this as well. In fact, we estimate you know, five years into 5G that about 75% of the tonnage we expect on our network will actually be from industrial um, and uh, enterprise use cases and not from video or consumer use, or it might be video, but it's a video for industrial use cases. So how are we gonna address this and what, what is Sprint applying to this, uh, this problem? We have the advantage of having about um, 150, a little bit over 150 megahertz on average of uh, two and a half gigahertz spectrum, band 41 in LTE, band N41 in 5G um, that we have to play with. Um, we are deployed some of that for LTE, but there's still much of it that is still um, available for, for 5G and R. Um, earlier in the Q&A, there was a comment about two and a half gigahertz being high bandwidth, high, high spe bandwidth spectrum. Uh, certainly was the case. And uh, now when we're talking 28 gigahertz, 60 gigahertz, uh, 70, 80 gigahertz, um, it's actually quite at least middle band, if not eventually going to become low band when you talk about these things. We think that the, the combination of our breadth and depth of spectrum here and the relatively low frequency of it will give us a great um, advantage in terms of both capacity and coverage uh, here in the US for, for these 5G use cases. This band already in the, in <clears throat> globally for LTE has the three largest economies in the world, the US, China, and Japan, all use band 41 and now India as well, so the two most populous countries in, the, in the, um, the world. And going forward, I think it's natural for us with the spectrum to leverage that for 5G as well. So we've been working on this strategy for a couple of years. We announced it in, in January or so. We actually won an award on Monday night for the most innovative uh, 5G strategy in, in the US. Um, this Leverage is massive MIMO to a great degree. This has been something that the industry is obviously, everyone has been looking forward to. Um, I should mention for those who don't know, band 41, N41 is TDD, and unlike most of the spectrum that's already deployed. And TDD has some great advantages when it comes to doing massive MIMO because already we're doing channel sounding and it's very natural to do that. And so 100% of our phones on day one can connect to this uh, network and, um, and take advantage of the beam forming that is possible. Uh, this isn't really a typo in the title. It's going to be leveraged, and we actually have the first sites on air already, deploying it for, for LTE capacity, and then a software upgrade to 5G and R so that we don't have to go and deploy new hardware in addition to what we're doing for, for our LTE capacity augments. The smaller picture you see there is actually the Samsung radio in Korea, and the smaller of the two units there is the integrated uh, antenna radio uh, massive MIMO unit adjacent to uh, an 88R, uh, which is what we have deployed now, 88R antenna system uh, for LTE. So it gives you a sense of the size, even though, the, even though the, 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 the collectively known as colloquially known as massive MIMO is actually not necessarily massive. It actually is fairly compact, even compared to our existing antennas. And then that's a Nokia unit that has the cover off, so you can see the 128 antennas in there: 64 transmit, 64 receive. So we trialed. I'm mentioning all three of our vendors here just to make sure we're all even, Stephen. Um, we trialed with Ericsson uh, last summer, 
uh, in Seattle, and everything on that circle we, we covered in the trial. A uh, big question for us was how good was beamforming going to be? How, what, what advantages would we get from a capacity perspective, and, and actually from a coverage perspective as well, from beamforming? And we were quite pleasantly surprised with that. I'll, I'll show some results in the next slide. Um, you know, it's almost like uh, getting free spectrum because we were able to reuse the same uh, 60 to 100 uh, megahertz of spectrum for 5G, able to reuse it for multiple users at the same time because they're we're forming multiple beams to them. And so that's as, as a as an operator, you always like free spectrum. It's not really free, and uh, this is just a great technology to help exploit what we already have. Um, we Initially, when we did this, uh, Ericsson came with a 10 gigabit uh, radio in the uh, high bands, uh, 80 gigahertz, and uh, that seemed overkill given what we're used to in LTE, but when I show you the next results, it's actually going to be in a fully loaded radio. That's really what we're going to need for backhaul. So. Um, and this isn't going to be on day one when it's launched, but we will be able to sustain nine gigabits of throughput on a uh, three-sector site because of um, the, the advantages that all this technology gives us. Uh, we have not tested, to be clear, NR yet because we don't have the software. This is extrapolated from our LTE testing, which was admittedly early days. So it, it probably won't get better than this, but it might. But we're really seeing average sector throughput of about six times. That's the that's the advantage of doing the beam forming and really getting that extra capacity. And even at cell edge, we're seeing a, a good big capacity increase. We will deploy this for LTE. Like I said, we already have our first sites on air in three markets. Uh, we are doing 32T, 32R for LTE. And then when we load the software for 5G and R and it's all finalized, we will turn that on as well with 32T, 32R. We did this previous generation with WiMAX and LTE and earlier radios the AT8R radios, we had both technologies on and in what we call split mode. And then as we turned off the legacy technology, we can take advantage of uh, even a better radio going forward. I add this here um, primarily, again, to level set. I suspect everybody in the room has, has seen these charts from the ITU uh, papers uh, early on. But I think oftentimes we get so enamored in the weeds of how we're going to get there and challenges with millimeter wave propagation or uh, how we're going to free up spectrum that's used by three other different users that we forget how big and audacious this goal is we're trying to achieve. Um, the, 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 the numbers on here are stunning when you think about the capacity increases, the improvements in battery life, the improvements in reliability that are promised and admittedly um, we're going to, as an industry, come up the hype curve, and then there's going to be some disappointment because people will expect all this to happen on day one, and it won't. Um, but it is a promise. And I often talk about 5G in the context of where Ethernet was when it was in its infancy. I'm old enough to remember the early days of Ethernet, wired Ethernet, where you literally have to, if you wanted to attach another computer, you literally had to drill a hole into the cable and tap into it. Uh, that's kind of like what 1G was in, 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 in the early days of, of, of wireless. We're now at the point where this is exactly going to be on par with Wi-Fi, in my mind, in fact, better from the overall cap capability and certainly wide area, and uh, ecosystem is large, and I think the impact will be a similar impact 10 years from now to that, what Ethernet had. And Ethernet evolved. It was a technology that morphed in so many different ways, including Wi-Fi, but it was the foundation of everything in networking up until you know, other than what we've been doing in, in wireless, in, in licensed spectrum. And I think that will only continue. This will become a parallel, similar umbrella technology that will be everywhere and ubiquitous. So Sprint has the advantage, not everybody here maybe even knows Sprint because um, we're only operating in the US. But we have the advantage of being a member of the, uh, uh, arguably the most powerful tech uh, ecosystem in the world. Uh, is 85% owned by um, Masasan and SoftBank. And so one of the advantages we have is I talk about 5G. If you think about, in the US at least, I'm not sure what phones were popular in all of your countries, but when LTE was in its infancy, before it was deployed, but talked about all the technology, the Motorola Razor flip phone was the, the cool device. And I remember everybody going, why do I need 10 megabits or 20 megabits to my Motorola flip phone? That doesn't make any sense. Well, obviously, there are other people in the world besides operators, and, and we worry about what we have to do. But there are other people innovating alongside us. And the, the ARM, for example, all the, the uh, SoftBank companies here are innovating, in addition to many others. And one of the advantages we see is working with them, 
we can go to an Uber and say, you know, tell us what you're doing in self-driving cars. How can we help you? How can we plan together um, a little less arm's length as would, would be typical for, um, for operators that weren't part of the same parent company? And I think that that's hugely important because we can all talk about use cases, and there's many that you've, you've heard ad infinitum, and I'll have a slide on, on some of them here. But for as much as we, as, as this industry, can come up with ideas, there are going to be 10 ideas for every good idea we have. There are going to be 10 other good ideas or great ideas that will drive us even further. And whether it's you know, some new device like the iPhone was that helped spur on smartphones and, and, and what we do today every day with our smartphones, there will be similar uh, capabilities that come forward. So all of these different areas that I'm sure we'll talk about in the next day and a half are going to be important to all of us as a business. But I'm sure there are going to be others as well, equally important going forward that we as a mobile industry haven't thought about because there are other creative people working on those problems as well. So with that, I will stop and take questions. I think Vicki is going to moderate. Just raise your hands and we'll get a microphone to you as quickly as possible. Any questions for Ron? Okay, so we're shy. Oh, wait. Right here, and another one here. Okay, and another one up there, uh, okay. Thank you. Name uh, and company, please. Uh, oh, Mel Villardi, now Corporation. Um, nine gigabit per three sector. Uh, this is all your 2.5 gigahertz, and you split them for 4, 4G LTE, and the rest would be 5G new radio? That, that was an ENDC uh, number, so it's initially we don't have 5G standalone today. So when we, when we launch, it'll be LTE as the anchor carrier um, alongside the, the, the 5G NR. The, the, if the same amount of spectrum, 5G standalone would be only better in terms of uh, capacity, but that's the, the ENDC number. No, no millimeter wave at all? Just no the millimeter 2 .5? wave, no. Thank you. Do you have another question there was, right there here? Was one up there. Hi, my name is Ashok Rao from SES, satellite company. Um, just a question about uh, the, the, the MIMO results that you uh, presented. Is there any, uh, any support required in the device for this kind of massive MIMO, or is it all just done on, on the base station side? When we, we, I didn't give the exact schedule for when we launch. When we launch next first half of next year, so it'll be an interesting race between the U.S. and Korea because we have a similar time scale for what we're planning on doing. We are launching with smartphones um, and some other devices as well. So um, the devices are going along, uh, alongside. Uh, one advantage we have in Massive MIMO with TDD uh, is that channel sounding that goes on back and forth uh, already in TDD it happens with all the phones we have that support Band 41 today. So they don't have to be a 5G phone to take advantage of beamforming with this technology. They already support it without any uh, maintenance release of software. In FDD, you have to do a maintenance release to support the messaging to know that what the channel sounding is looking like. And so that's an advantage we have in TDD. Okay, I think we had another question over here, correct? We see a hand right here. Third row back in the middle. Right here. He's coming. He's getting his exercise. Put your hand up. Did you have a question? Oh, no. It's like an auction. You bought it. Don't put your hand up. It's an auction. <laughs> Anyone else with a question? OK, I'm going to ask kind of a rudimentary one. Okay. Would you define how you're going to transition? Sprint is going to transition from LTE to 5G with the network? Sure. Um, with having LTE in the same radios for, for both uh, Massive MIMO, for both LTE and 5G NR, uh, like I said, the LTE will be the anchor carrier. Um, ENDC is needed initially with option 3X for the core until there's a standalone core. And that gives us a chance to satisfy all the capacity demands for our LTE-only customers as well as anchor 5G customers to take advantage of both, both bands, both technologies. Um, over time, we'll, we'll migrate to a, a standalone core, but uh, we don't need to do that right away. And in fact, it's not fully defined yet, so we can move forward and launch um, next year, but then we can migrate over time. As we get 5G phones out there, I'm sure we will reduce the capacity in LTE and sort of do the natural pruning and, and augment capacity in, in, in 5G. Okay, and just to reflect on the spectrum panel that we heard just a little while ago, what is Sprint's 
strategy for using their current spectrum and yeah. So it dovetails with the earlier question about millimeter wave. Um, we're going to use the assets we have right now, uh, for sure, which is their 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. So that uh, gets us a long ways. And when you see the capacity that's possible with that, 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 that will be good for both coverage and capacity. Uh, there are upcoming millimeter wave auctions that um, you can expect that we might, as any operator might be interested in. Um, and we see that as a longer term technology that's necessary, but not necessary for us in, in the immediate future. OK, are there any uh, questions? Right here, too. Chris, we had one. Well, I'll pass the baton, but uh, while you're oh. doing this, quick question. You talked about the 2.5 uh, TDD ecosystem. Do you work closely with the other uh, countries and operators that have the 2.5 TDD to help build that ecosystem and make sure it's expanding appropriately for, for Sprint here in the United no, States? No, absolutely. So we, when we started um, with this, uh, it was probably not going to be TDD spectrum. And we worked closely with Japan, China, and, uh, a larger consortium of operators uh, called the GTI, Global TDD uh, LT Initiative. Um, that worked on a lot of ecosystem issues that, that like I said earlier, created the spectrum as the, the, the biggest spectrum in LTE right now in terms of number of users between China, Japan, and the US. And now India's starting to deploy as well. So there's, all of us are working together in, in GTI and, and other you know, one on one op opportunities as well. Sharon? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Was, yeah, Susan. sorry, I'll, I'll go first. Susan Welsh, Tucker Maldo with Strategy Up. Nice to hear you talking about this, Ron. I think in this global forum, it's interesting, as a technology person, you talked at investing in the net. Uh, really fading in and out, sorry. In terms of you as a technology team, talking to the team doing the strategy and the financing and the go-to-market, how do you think about your investments between 5G and LTE and how that evolves over time? Because I think there's a lot of global operators and regions thinking about, you know, when do we put the investment into 5G? Obviously, a lot of what you're doing is 5G ready, and it's 5G investment, but, but how do you have that conversation internally? It's, it's very iterative. So... You know, th there are use cases we can dream up, which um, I don't see as being a real reality for the next four or five, maybe even longer than that years. I, I personally am not going to volunteer for robotic surgery. I'm, I'm sure that it'll work great, but that's not going to be my personal uh, first use case I'll volunteer for. Um, and, you know, in the U.S. at least, with uh, it's like self-driving cars, when you consider the, the, the cloud intelligence, the, the intelligence being in the cloud rather than embedded in the car as it is today, um, we have societal issues to work through, for example. The, it's not really clear if your self-driving car on, a net, on our network uh, causes an accident, who's really responsible and how that all gets sorted out. We have issues we need to work through as a society on those. But for the more close in uh, areas, I think that uh, you know, what we can do in more immediately is enable the 5G, like I said, with the, with the radios coming out. We already have a plan to put edge compute out there, and really the question is how far, what's the edge? How close to the edge do you get? And you're, you're not going to go to every single site with servers if there's no business case for that. So it really is parsing down the business case for 5G, and I think some of this is getting it out there so we can start having the innovators implement on something new that has new, new, new capabilities beyond LTE. And then, um, and like I said, we needed to do this anyway for LTE capacity. And having it for 5G and R is a simple software upgrade, so relatively inexpensive compared to deploying new radios. And then as we roll out new use cases, then it's going to be a question of how far we push edge compute and where, where exactly do we uh, incur additional costs there. So we iterate a lot with the business folks on their thinking, trying to timeline what's realistic. Like I said, for some of these markets, it's going to be far enough out where we don't need to make investments today. But in other areas, um, you know, if you think about uh, online gaming and things like that, it potentially could happen much sooner. And then it's just a question of how we stage that and make the right business case in terms of the cost versus the, the overall business can. So we're going to have to end right here. But I know that Sharon has a question, so maybe if you can meet with her off stage. Sure. So thanks very much, Ron. Thank Appreciate you. it.